Some of the things that these polyphenols do, Eric. These polyphenols can help you have more energy, and polyphenols are great for athletes. It sounds like it's going to help a whole lot more people than just bloating. Go to lovemytummy.com slash spoonie. Good morning. It is the Gut Check Project. I'm Eric Rieger here with your host, Dr. Ken Brown. What's going on, Dr. Ken? Man, we got all kinds of stuff going on. This is kind of an exciting show because we did a remote location with a really, really cool guy, Kiran Krishnan. Get on, Krishnan. Get on. So we ended up taking all of our equipment down to IFM. That's the functional medicine meeting. And we filmed the podcast with him. And I, I think it's fantastic. It, it really is some of the coolest microbiology and incredible explanations. So this second hour, or it's going to yeah. be the second hour, second. is going to be amazing. I think it's so cool. This is actually really cool because we can look into the future and say, we know 100% that we are going to deliver in the second hour because it, he did an awesome job. There's lots of eye-opening anecdotes that I, well, I call them anecdotes. They were, they were just new in concept the way that he said them. But then you look back and you're like, it just makes sense. It just makes sense. He, he, he is the micro microbiologist behind Megaspore and it's a spore-based probiotic. We're going to get into that uh, whenever we have him on the show here in an hour. Yeah, I think if, if you have ever been interested in taking a probiotic, you absolutely have to listen to this because he has a lot of evidence about the industry of probiotics, how many people are making probiotics that are really not on the up and up, and they don't really know where their product is coming from. Uh, we covered that. We covered why a soil-based spore biotic is much better. And then we went deep dive into the science of how it does. So I really, really liked that that whole podcast that we did with him. I did too. Um, if you are new to the Gut Check Project, this is the Gut Check Project with your host, uh, Dr. Ken Brown. We check our egos at the door because nothing is off the table. And you may already want to know, I saw y'all post... Uh, we could win free Atron Teal and KBMD CBD. So let's just get straight to it. Dr. Ken, what should they do if they would like to win the Signature Protection Package? The Signature Protection Package. Go to Gut Check Project, sign up, uh, subscribe, share, and do they have to take a picture of it to get the to get enrolled, or how does that work? You may want to take a screenshot just so that if you happen to win, when we will draw a winner in the mid part of uh, July, actually at least five winners, uh, if the... If the numbers keep coming in on iTunes like they are now, we may have more than five winners, which would be great. But you can go to iTunes or YouTube, search Gut Check Project, basically subscribe, take a screenshot if you wish, but then go to gutcheckproject.com, connect, let us know that you subscribed, and then you're entered. That's all there is to it. Subscribe, come let us know, gutcheckproject.com, search for Gut Check Project on YouTube and or iTunes, and uh, tell a friend about it. Because the more we grow, the more we give away. That's all there is to it. Absolutely. And if you are enjoying this, let us know so that we can keep doing what y'all want to hear about. No, no doubt. So whenever you connect, you'll see that you can, you can actually suggest um, uh, guests, topics for the show. We've already been able to book some in advance with, with uh, some of those suggestions. So really looking forward to that. Today, you'll get a glimpse of one of those suggestions that came from a friend of ours named Bridget a little over a year ago when she knew that we wanted to have a show. And uh, this, this delivers. If, if you've ever really wondered, what is it about probiotics that even mean anything, and am I taking the right one? I promise you, if you're not taking one from Megaspore or a mega, uh, Megaspore or Microbiome Labs, let me get that right, sorry for stumbling there, then you're probably not taking a reputable or a probiotic that can actually prove that it's worth it. So as we're launching the KBMD box, we got a lot of feedback from people. They want to know what's in the box. And one of the reasons why you're going to have two really cool things, which is Atron Teal and Megaspore, is because in this podcast, he explains how the polyphenols in Atron Teal actually augment the spore-based biotic, and you can improve your health and improve the diversity of your microbiome with that. Yeah, no doubt. And on top of that, uh, the biggest hangup that you had long ago is how do I even know that these probiotics that people are taking are getting to work where I need them to work? If you're, if you're ingesting them and they're encapsulated and they're breaking open the small bowel, well, that, you might as well just cut a hole in your belly and just pour in a bunch of stuff. That doesn't make sense. He essentially addresses all of that and talks why the science behind spore-based probiotics is the answer. 
So I went on Melanie Avalon's new show called The Melanie Avalon Show. I right. did that on Monday, and we talked exactly like this. That when you listen to guys like Eamon Quigley, who have been studying probiotics for 40 years, the thing that he says the best is, we can, they do amazing things in a Petri dish. We just can't get them to replicate that in the human body because it's very, very complex. We get into big detail about how that actually happens. How many people have we had come through the GI clinic who have said, uh, I had GI distress or whatever that, whatever symptom it was it happened to be, but I had GI distress and then I began to take a probiotic and it went away for a little while. And then after name the time interval, four weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks, whatever it is, suddenly they returned to that feeling or those symptoms. And oftentimes what I hear is that it was worse. And so basically it's, your, the idea, and if I'm applying what uh, Quran said correctly, is that taking the wrong delivery system of probiotics is actually just dumping uh, bacteria where it ne doesn't necessarily belong. So when I see these people with really bad bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, right. uh -huh. and they start taking it, they go, man, I got way worse. That gives me a hint of what's going on. Sure. The Cedar sinai protocol with Dr. Pimentel is that they don't let their patients take probiotics. Now, Quran has some great research showing that these spore-based biotics can actually help with leaky gut and intestinal permeability. And I think it's funny because patients go, oh, I've tried probiotics before, but that's a lot like when people say, oh, I've tried CBD before. Right. And they're like, I didn't get any response. I'm like, well, CBD is a lot like the supplement industry. There's a lot of products out there which they do not show and the manufacturing process is not on the up and up. So that's how come we see so many people that take the KBMD CBD and they're like, wow, I really feel a huge difference. And it's because we know exactly with a, with a certificate of analysis how many milligrams is actually in there. And we know we're doing a whole series of videos about why your body needs CBD. Tell me about the dosing of CBD. So if any of you have any questions about that you have with CBD, send them over so that we can do videos and put them out there and try and educate. My job here is to educate everyone on the science of these different things. Always, you know, the gut check project, check your ego at the door and start relearning everything. And that's what I had to do with CBD. That's what I'm doing with probiotics. Right. When we're launching this box, this is part of it. So the first box that, that we're launching, the ingredients that we put in there, the Megaspore and the Atrantil are gonna work together and they're, they're gonna begin to heal your gut. Then I put in life extension, comprehensive digestive enzymes so that you can make sure that you can absorb all your micronutrients I want to protect your brain, and we put in there um, organic turmeric from um, Omica, and they have this really cool blend of putting in amla, which has been shown to help with insulin sensitivity, and ginger, which has been shown to help with digestive issues. So those four things right there, and then we threw in something really cool. Something called Trusi, T R U S I I. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, I recently I, I discovered this because my patients were telling me about it. And Memberbox, they were saying that so many of the other influencers were having really good success with it. So I started looking at the science. Micronized hydrogen. And as it turns out, micronized hydrogen, nanoparticles of hydrogen, can actually help at a cellular level decrease inflammation. So here we were protecting your gut. And then. All these things added up. We're gonna throw in a couple other really cool products. A lot of people take apple cider vinegar, so we went with Vermont Village organic flavored apple cider vinegar that actually tastes good. And then a special guest from, or a special gift from me to everyone that signs up. In addition to that, we should say that anybody that signs up for the KBMD member box, uh, we do not have CBD in it yet, because there's a lot of regulatory stuff that's going on, but you will be given a discount. Is that correct? They can. 100%, you sign up, you'll get access that nobody else gets on CBD. Uh, with KBMD CBD being a certified COA uh, product already, so you know that it's authentic, it's already priced as the best value, high-quality CBD that's available anyhow. Simply, you sign up for the KBMD box, kbmdbox.com. You will then be able to get price access to uh, KBMD CBD that's not available on really anywhere on the web so absolutely and so this is you know it's the old the old adage membership has its privileges that's what we're <laughs> trying to do with the kbmd community when you get on there you're getting 250 dollars worth of products sent to you that are going to that i see work in my patients that's the key to this is that i see these things work and we're adding a little bit more 
and it's over a hundred and three dollars savings. So you're not going to be able to find these products cheaper anywhere. They come right to you. And then with the feedback we get, we're going to continue to evolve. We're going to get more products in. We're going to be able to add more. We're going to get, I mean, it's going to be really fun in addition to being able to get discounts on CBD. Just to add to it. So simply what, what I believe, Ken, you're saying is that this is an opportunity if you take supplements whatsoever that you're going to get supplements that work, you're going to get them all for a price that is inaccessible. It's essentially like Costco for healthcare providers as, as suggestions, right? And then we don't just talk about the science or the claims that are on the label. We, we essentially just tell you all of the benefits that can be scientifically proven for this product that's in there. What actually is happening for you as your benefit, correct? Exactly. And then when you sign up, you get access to this big marketplace. So we've already had several people that built, uh, in addition to what they're already getting, they're adding a few other things. And, and this is going to be a really fun, exciting time as we launch this. It's an opportunity to change the landscape of health. I want to see what happens with people. I would love to see people go back into the regular doctor and find out that these great things are happening. Like, oh, my, my um, insulin sensitivity is improving because we know that multiple products in there actually help with that. Oh, I'm sleeping better because we know that the magnesium in the truce can help with that. We're going to start doing that. And then as we get feedback from everybody, we're going to learn, hey, can you do something? And some of my patients have already been asking about this. Hey, I have a, I take this supplement for my eyes. Is mm-hmm. there any way that we can get on there? And I'm like, well, we're going to work to get that product on this marketplace so that you can get it at a huge discount. So it's going to be a really, really fun, exciting, hopefully life-changing experience for anybody that signs up. This is essentially an environment where it is totally consumer driven. It's done for the benefit of the consumer. And it's essentially like walking through the store saying, does this work for me? Does this work for me? And then turning back to a physician and saying, I would suggest this one. And actually, I don't know so much about that one. And which is really cool. And that's what a lot of people are looking for whenever they're trying to shop. And then everybody that's involved in this community, there's a lot of other healthcare providers. We've got gynecologic experts. We've got functional medicine doctors. We've got chiropractors. We have um, health nutritionists. And we're all bouncing ideas off each other. So I can find out. That's how I found out about Trucy, actually. Right. They're like, no, you you have to try this. It's awesome. And it's incredible the value that we're getting on that. So this is going to be really neat. I just want to see this happen. And, of course, 100% money back guarantee. Go to kvmdbox.com. Check it out. Check it out. Well, uh, to move forward, Dr. Brown, I didn't want, before we got down to the topics, I just wanted to ask you, What's going on with uh, the uh, the oldest tennis player uh, in your family? Yeah, so Lucas. Lucas right now is with his coach in Haverford, Pennsylvania, playing in ITF, which is the International Tennis Federation. It's the, um, I guess it's 18 and under junior pro circuit where international people can come from all over. It's a grass court tournament. So these pitchers are just beautiful. He's at some country club. You have to wear all white, just like you're going to Wimbledon. right. Wimbledon has those same rules. So they treat it just like that. And he's doing really well. Apparently this grass surface suits his game because he's in the semifinals playing tomorrow. He's got today off and then playing the semifinals tomorrow. So, um, and the boy he's going to be playing is a, uh, he's from Thailand. Okay. And he, he lives in Florida at, at one of the, um, at one of the academies. academies there. Yeah. yeah. And so Lucas knows of him because these boys are starting to kind of, Go around. He's a few years older, but uh, you know. So hopefully we'll see what happens. But I'm just proud that he got here all the way on grass. Yeah, so. that picture that you showed looks like they're playing on a bent grass green. That is oh, it's amazing. So pretty. Heck yeah. I mean, level <laughs> doesn't look like the line would be hard. You could definitely put straight for the hole. But yeah, that is uh, that is wild. Yeah, hey, it is beautiful. Uh, the the boys for me are just. It's all about uh, uh, taking a break from basketball. Next week being the fourth of July. Just uh, for the listeners, we won't have a live show next week because the fourth is on Thursday. Uh, family and I are, are going to take a break and head up to, uh, to Colorado for a couple of days, get out of the heat here in Texas, which actually hasn't been that bad so far this year. But, um, uh, while we were getting ready for the show, something that I thought was really funny after we've been looking at, uh, or hearing so much about how people have found meat replacements. Have you seen this new <laughs> commercial for, uh, for Arby's that was on online? So we just looked this up. Somebody texted Eric, said, yeah, this is a, check out the new Arby's um, 
Arby's unveils vegetables <laughs> made from meat. And there's a whole how-to <laughs> where they they now have meat carrots to sort of um, fight back against the whole, what, it's the amazing, what's, what's everybody doing now? Chef Patrick, Chef what's Patrick, the... Uh, uh, there's Beyond, Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger. Yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. So this is the fight back on that. <laughs> <laughs> we have the meats. They basically took meat and shaped it as a carrot, rolled it in <laughs> carrot dust, and then cooked it. <laughs> It's pretty. Uh, it's pretty. It's pretty interesting. It's pretty awesome. But Rob Wolf was the one who uh, who shared that, which oh, I thought was really funny. That is funny. <laughs> so you want to know what else is really funny this past weekend? What's that? So Lloyd was out of town, and while she was out, I decided to be a good hubby, and I was going to get her car detailed. Oh, nice! And so I took it in and like did the whole, just keep it for a few hours. They did the inside and out, and you know the full on detailing. And I'm proud of myself. I go to pick it up, driving home. I don't drive a car very often, and I clipped a curb or a pothole or something. I just went whack, and next thing I know, I blew a big old hole in that tire. Nice. Yeah, it was so awesome. It was so neat. And so <laughs> um, found out that her Acura roadside assistance had run out, and I had canceled that on our insurance because we have Acura roadside assistance. Why would I need that? Right. So I had neither. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm towing this thing to a tire shop. On a, It was on Saturday night. Towed it, uh, left it at a uh, discount tire or whatever. I was going to go fix it the next day. Well, they're closed on Sunday. Oh, nice. So Lloyd arrived Sunday night. And not only. No car. Yeah. <laughs> not only can I not brag about me washing the car or, you know, detailing the car. It's, uh, yeah, I, I pretty much screwed it up. So it's sitting there. We'll have to go get it tomorrow. Hey, man, it was, it was the intention that matters, right? I mean, you hope. Yeah, exactly. Well, what do you got in the, in the corner? I know that we've gone, you and I have kicked back and forth a bunch of really cool articles this last week, and I didn't really know which direction you were going to go today because there's a lot there. But uh, why don't you go ahead and lead off with uh, your favorite one so far? Well, you know what's really interesting? There's been a lot of recent news. There was uh, Melanie Avalon and I actually talked about this one, which I think everybody should at least take, take a look at sure. and, and realize something. There was two studies published in the uh, British Medical Journal okay, where it looked at how when people take – uh, really kind of refined diets that all cause mortality increases significantly. And then there was another study where they looked at where cardiovascular events goes up. So then they started looking at what it does to the microbiome. So just, just for clarity for, for refined diets, we're talking, uh, we're talking about things where people have refined sugars, refined carbohydrates, things that have been bleached, correct? Like uh, flour, et cetera. Right. Well, Oh, oh there okay. we are. Sorry about that. Um, so what they're actually looking at is anything that's that has that, that it's in a package, they uh-huh. have to be stabilizers, and Chef Patrick could probably expand on this, but they were looking at that most of these things have emulsifiers in them, they have um, lots of sugar, and a very interesting concept, they usually decrease the amount of fiber content. And the reason for that is, is that fiber keeps you full, mm. this is not encourage you to keep popping the Cheetos or whatever, so Chef Patrick... Do you know what an emulsifier is when they're dealing with uh, processed foods? Yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of them, but, uh, you know, it's a binding agent. Uh, modified food starches, things like that, yeah. It's, uh, they're chemically, uh, you know, it's a natural substance, chemically uh, modified to be cheaper, and uh, you need less of it. So they, they, they work really well as a thickener, something to get a texture to, uh, to breads or things like that, too. So what they showed is these emulsifiers. So those three things, the emulsifier actually damages your good microbiome. And then the sugar feeds bacteria and allows them to grow more. The lack of fiber means that your microbiome does not use that as a prebiotic, so your diversity decreases. So you don't have the benefit of having your microbiome help you. So not only do we now know that that definitely increases cardiovascular risk and all-cause mortality, now we've got molecular reasons of how it messes with your microbiome. So it's kind of a fascinating thing because they... What they showed is that when these bacteria get hurt by the emulsifier, mm-hmm. they do not, uh, they cannot break down the prebiotics, which then allows the bacteria to produce short chain fatty acids, which your body works and uses as fuel in, in the colonic cells. So it becomes this very vicious cycle. That replacement of fiber, I would imagine, would also uh, increase the glycemic index then of those foods, making them also more dangerous, correct? 100%. What they showed is by not having these short chain fatty acids floating around, Uh inflammation in your body goes up. Has to. So they showed in these animal models that cortisol and CRP go up, that C-reactive protein. Protein, yeah. 
And what that does, and this is, you're going to love this, they showed, and this is the first time I've seen this, that when your cortisol and CRP goes up, you actually block, the inflammation blocks your response to leptin. Ghrelin is the hormone that makes you hungry. Leptin makes you, makes full. you full. Yeah. So you open up a package of something, you start eating, and you start getting in the habit of doing that on a regular basis, you're changing your microbiome, you are not decreasing, in, you, you're not allowing your own bacteria to help you decrease the inflammatory response of anything, it means short chain fatty acids go down, you will get hungrier, you eat more of it, more of the bacteria that like that start putting out signals, and so a lot of times, these are when people are like, man, why can't I quit eating this junk food? There's a cycle going on, and all of this we're now seeing on a cellular level what's actually happening. What a huge explanation. So if, you, if, if you're experiencing already some inflammation that you can see, and it doesn't have to be anything uh, terrible, but if you have acne, then obviously feeding it more of a refined food diet would simply just be feeding into the inflammation process that you're currently experiencing, right? Exactly. So if you've got a child at home, maybe this even just these four minutes is worth watching on why you need to steer away from sugary cereals for, for breakfast or why you need to not come straight home and turn straight to a bag of chips or something else like that because you're going to not be, you're not going to feel full in the, the right way and you're just going to con keep consuming really bad calories. Yeah, you wake up and you take in and those cereals, that's such a great example. We've talked about that before on the show where... I grew up on Fruity Pebbles and stuff like that. I, I, I cringe. It's cringeworthy it's gross. thinking about it now. And now we know that you're not feeding your bacteria what it really needs, which polyphenols work really well to feed your bacteria. We know that fiber does that as well so that you can have a very diverse microbiome. The key is to have a diverse microbiome. They showed that the more people that eat this, they have a much more narrow spectrum. So you do not have the benefit of that microbiome. You blunt your leptin response, so you're always kind of hungry. You never really feel full. And then, let's take it up one step. They didn't get into this, but I've actually had some patients that were food chemists working for, I don't know, I don't remember, Frito-Lay or something like that. Right. And they actually work on having, a, more than likely, it's an emulsifier, now that I think about it, to slide more easily so that the food goes down quicker, so that the Fritos go down quicker and all that stuff. So there's... A lot of science being put into it to try and get people to open up bags and just rum, 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 rum. Yeah, they're engineering to make you dependent upon their crappy food. And it's not going to benefit you in the long term. It's so weird. But it's, I mean, it's absolutely nuts. Like, th at some point, we have to start getting involved and not letting companies destroy the general health. They have the money to take out the ad. <laughs> they have the money to make meat carrots. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you have these uh, you have these companies out there doing that, and it's an uphill battle. We're, we're you know the epidemic of childhood obesity. Hey, everybody's saying, "Oh, it's the activity, it's this and that." Well, yeah, that that has something to do with it. But what if we're really messing ourselves up on a cellular level that we're not even paying attention to? I, it's so hard though, on the grassroots level. If you're not, I just like you. I, I grew up on really sugary cereals. I mean, I'm sure if we could turn back the clock, I, I wouldn't want to do that at all. So it. It's like, how do you move forward? How do you educate your kids? And for the most part, I would say, even though my both of my boys feel it's incredibly boring for breakfast for them, we, Marie and I just don't buy that that kind of stuff. And ironically, since the boys, they're out for the summer, they've been earning their own money. One of the ways they rewarded themselves, they went and bought a box of crappy cereal. <laughs> you know, it's such a downer when I see it. And I don't want to be like, oh, you know, you can't because you have to kind of let them make some choices still. But at the same time, I look at it, I'm like, I just don't think they have any idea what they're, I mean, they don't, right? They don't, they don't know what it's doing cellularly. And I think when you're really young, you don't feel the effects as much. But the truth is, as much as they play sports and that inflammation that they work up, it's not helping them heal. They aren't recovering. I so. mean, we talked about that, that the, the original thing of breakfast being the most important part of the day was actually an ad campaign in 1940 when Grape Nuts came out. Totally. Yeah, the other day I went without my normal bacon and eggs, and I felt great. So You did intermittent fasting. Yeah, I did. It was awesome. Yeah, and I was, still wasn't hungry until about 3 in the afternoon. I got another really cool little tidbit that I want to talk about regarding bacteria and CBD when we come back. 
All right. Wow. That was a quick half hour. So like and share, like and share Gut Check Project on YouTube and iTunes. We will catch you on the back end. Let us hear from you at gutcheckproject.com. If you are trying to quit drinking or doing too many drugs, listen to me. You don't know me and we'll never meet. I had a problem like you once. I drank and used to party a little too much till it got out of control and almost ruined my life. I realized I needed help to fix my problem before it totally destroyed me. If you've tried to fix your drinking and drug problem and you know you can't do it alone, you need to call the National Treatment Advisors. They'll immerse you into a 30-day program to replace your old habits with new habits and totally change your life. And if you have PPO, private health insurance, the entire program may be covered. Fix your problem right now before it gets any worse. Get clean. Call now and learn more. 800-296-1252. 800-296-1252. 800-296-1252. 800-296-1252. Are you tired of high cable TV rates? Sign up for Dish today and get a $500 bonus offer while supplies last. Plus, lock in your price for two years guaranteed. Call All-American Dish, your dish-authorized retailer now. 800-570-6630. 800-570-6630. That's 800-570-6630. Offers require credit qualification, 24-month commitment, early termination fee, and e-auto pay. Restrictions apply. Call for details. Fast Track Student Loans can get your student loan loans out of default, stop any wage garnishments, stop collection calls, and stop seizure of your tax refund. Give yourself a break. Stop the stress and get your student loan payments down to as little as $25 a month based on what you can afford to pay. 800-709-4395. 800-709-4395. 800-709-4395. 800-709-4395. All right, we're back. Gut Check Project, second half hour. This is episode number 16. I don't even think we said that the last half hour. Episode number 16. Episode number 16. Can't wait till we get to 20. That's when they say the magic happens. I don't even know what that means. But I do know that our subscribers are growing, so I certainly appreciate that. If you'd like to win your very own signature package from Dr. Brown and KBMD Health, you can get your very own Atron Teal Month Supply as well as KBMD CBD simply by going to iTunes or YouTube or both and subscribe and share and then go to gutcheckproject.com and let us know that you did it. That's all you have to do. Do all of those things. Uh, Dr. Brown, is there anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, I just want to add that that's the signature package. And the reason why we call it the signature package is because what my what I'm trying to do is bridge some gaps and bring traditional science into natural places. And right now, I think that what we're lacking a lot of is just data and science on CBD. There's so much confusion about it. The reason why it's a signature package is because we know that the polyphenols in Atrantil actually decrease the enzyme that breaks down your own endocannabinoids. Right. And this is they work together to increase. So that's what I was seeing in my practice. When people take the CBD and Atrantil, they feel markedly better. There was a there's so many things to get to. Like there's a recent article where it was looking at how CBD actually is very effective against superbugs, better than antibiotics. Science is pretty thick on that. Go to kbmdhealth.com, sign up for KBMD Box, and we, we're going to continually update that site with a lot of science, new science, and everything. But there's another article that I found a little bit more interesting that I wanted to cover. Hey, no, uh, let's get to that article just uh, just for those who haven't done it yet because it grows every single day. KBMDHealth.com, which is where you'll find GutCheckProject.com, et cetera. Just simply sign up for the newsletter. Over the next three weeks, the transition is going to be huge. What, uh, what Ken's talking about is that from KBMD, we're going to be able to put the science where actually the science hasn't been explained behind polyphenols, CBD, diet. It's for you. It's for free. But it's for you to be more educated, spend your money more wisely, stay more healthy. That's really what this whole thing's about. 
And we have the ability to find a lot of articles. Uh, a lot of my colleagues are like, well, there's no science on this. I'm like, no, 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 no. There's so much science on this. You just have to know where to look. And you have to have access to a lot of these articles. Right. So if anybody has questions like, hey, what can, do you, have you had any experience? Have you seen any articles on what it does for skin issues, for instance? Like if you're a dermatologist, it does, has this have any background on things like that? Psoriasis, eczema, acne, all kinds of different issues. Oh, have you seen any benefit with rheumatology where we're talking rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis well we're not making any claims here what i'm saying is that we're going to find the studies and see and they've had just like we did with the photobiomodulation just like we did with the stem cells we can find this stuff and really say now this makes some sense absolutely i mean really that's that was the whole idea why you started kbmd health in the first place is just find a place where people can turn these are the same questions that come to the gi clinic every single day and so now we've got a place where people can turn and start finding some real answers. Speaking of questions, yeah. this morning when I was working out, uh -huh. I was listening to Joe Rogan's podcast. Oh, nice. And he had uh, Bob Lazar on. Yeah. <laughs> Space. Space. Uh, so there's a, there's a new Netflix uh, movie out there where it's, uh, uh, what's it called? UFO and saucers or something like that. I think that. it even uses his name. It's UFOs and Bob Lazar or something. I honestly, I don't remember exactly what it's called, but yeah, L A I, L A Z A. I mean, I was avoiding it because I figured it was just going to be one of those conspiracy type things. But I don't know, man. He on Joe Rogan, the guy sounded like he was like legitimately scarred from the whole experience. And I yeah, don't I don't want to be painted into a corner, <laughs> but I I really kind of want to talk to him a little bit more in depth, and I want to see if he has any pictures because I thought it was really. Honestly, it seemed it seemed sincere, and maybe if he's that good at holding that that form for almost four decades, then wow. But I mean, he's he's had those stories for a really really long time, and, and, it's, and it's really messed him up. Yeah, I mean he's I mean he it, he honestly was saying I don't want to be here, but I need to get this story out. And while he was on Joe Rogan's show, it wasn't like he was bragging or anything. I don't know. It was weird. I was listening to another podcast. I uh, can't remember that comedian's name. It was on XM radio, but they were kind of trying to debunk all that and say that he was just, he's just crazy. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading an article that just came out that said film on Netflix finds UFO whistleblower Bob Lazar seeming less crazy than ever. Yeah. Well, but he, the funny thing is, is even just two decades ago, and I can't remember exactly what all of them were, but some of them were like bone scans, uh, identification systems. And the fact that, he said that there was a uh, certain isotope of uh, hydrogen that he knew existed before and had been scientifically denied. But it turns out that a handful of the things that he declared that he had seen before are suddenly now available. The bone scan machine that he described exactly as he described it is now available. The isotope of hydrogen that he described almost three and a half decades ago, everyone said didn't exist suddenly it exists now and it's really and he he's basically like i find this as a point of vindication i have stuck to this story and that's all been documented in fact they even i say they whoever the proverbial they is scrubbed his name as uh, he, he claims they scrubbed his name as being a student in attendance at a few different institutions so that's what the other podcast was talking about they're like how can you just have no you Records. just don't exist yeah yeah, they scrubbed his name from going to MIT or something like that. Mm -hmm. It was a and Cal Poly, Cal Poly, and MIT. Yeah, and they ended up scrubbing his name. That's what these guys are saying. They're like, that is impossible. But Somebody would have known him. Rec That's how come they think that he may just be crazy in his in his own story and sticking to it. But how is there nobody else saying, "Hey, I knew that guy. I went to school with him. He actually went here." That's the weird part is there is there's there's people who have signed affidavits who are listed as oh, really? students who have said that, yeah, he was totally in school with us. So it's I don't know. It's a very bizarre. I honestly knew nothing about it until I heard that same podcast. I didn't know anything about it. So, uh oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, you have a caller online from Alpha Centauri waiting. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Uh, no, I've spent a lot of time watching videos on YouTube. No, no, I haven't. I mean, uh, but uh, it's interesting. It's a fascinating story. His especially. Um, I haven't seen the new Netflix show, so or uh, I'm going to have to watch that. 
Yeah, sometime. check out Joe Rogan's show with yeah, Bob Lazar. I think the, well, you actually watch both, and I mm. think I think the Joe Rogan episode is probably more informative. I think so. Yeah. The, the Netflix thing is okay, but the, the hearing Bob just talk in his own voice, I found far more interesting, and certainly in terms of the validity, would be more compelling. If, quite honestly, if I'd seen the Netflix thing first, I don't know how much I would have believed. Oh really? Yeah, he just he just seemed far more genuine in just the the long form format you know, interview. And Joe Rogan is such a great host. He really is. He's a you know, intuitive question. So yeah, without question. Well, uh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, he thank has you not the, changed his story in over thirty years. Thanks for the phone call there, yeah. Patrick. Uh, Ken, we only got we only got twenty minutes till we get Quran on. You want to hit the? Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I want to hit this. So much like. Bob Lazar said, he goes, this is the stuff we're looking at. It just could be that like if you dumped a motorcycle on the on the street in Victorian times, oh. people are going to poke around at it. Somebody may figure out how to turn it on. That's kind of where he was saying. He's yeah. like, you know, there's just so much. Well, in science, we do the exact same thing. We're going to talk this next hour with Quran and probiotics and spore based biotics because the microbiome is a really big deal now. Atron Teal is NSF certified. That is certified for sport. The reason why that's a big deal is because we're making sure that we get no doping agents in here. And so right. athletes, pro athletes, college athletes, there's all this reaction to anti-doping and everybody keeps putting new things on the list. I got a new one for you. Okay. Probiotics may become anti-doping things. Really? If they can figure this out. Yeah. So if you have what you're saying is if you can test positive for probiotics, there is a chance that that would become a flag. There was they were referencing that there was and I don't remember um, what it was, but they whatever sport it was, a female had much higher levels of testosterone. Oh, and they probably, said for, probably curling. Yeah, yeah, probably. But they said for her to continue to compete at the Olympic level, she has to actually decrease her testosterone by taking some sort of testosterone blocker because whatever. So they, there's lots of different things that can be performance enhancers. What this study that just came out June 24th in Nature, what it talked about is elite athletes' gut bacteria give rodent runners a boost. So this group um, was looking, and it's pretty funny because when you talk about the tension with anti-doping, I just wonder if this will suddenly pop up on the anti-doping list. What they showed is that proportions of certain bacterial species increase after endurance athletes have completed a marathon. Furthermore, this type of bacteria that increases breaks down lactic acid and produces another compound called propionate. Okay. Lactic acid is what makes your muscles tired and sore and weak. Propionate can be used as a fuel. So then they looked at another group of people and... This was a series of 15 runners that they were looking at at the Boston Marathon. And they found that they looked at another group on some a bunch of very elite rowers, rowers uh, in Olympic trials, and they got very similar results. Basically, this type of bacteria called Velanella or Velanella atypica increased in both of these groups of people. So Velanella atypica appears to have adapted in these elite athletes to break down the lactic acid yeah and form that so is it chicken or the egg right are these people elite athletes because possibly they have a higher proportion of velanella or did they develop the velanella in response to constantly increasing the lactic acid in the body wow so that's what this group was trying to look at so they ended up taking a bunch of mice putting them on uh little wheels treadmills mice treadmills whatever they're called and they were able to show in the mice if they gave them velanella rectally and orally, they actually had decreased amounts of lactic acid. Now, I've done that before. I've gone and done, I went to the, uh, to the tri shop and did a whole lactic acid. You push yourself as far as you can go. Uh -huh. And my lactic acid just kept going up. And elite athletes, it'll start to go up and then it'll drop because it goes back into the Krebs cycle. Okay. So... Does that happen because they've got more of this Valinella, or does it happen because um, they're elite athletes and their bodies have adapted? I don't know. It's really interesting. So their ability essentially uh, to to work uh, or outwork others because they function better in an anaerobic state. Is that right? No. No. Be once they go into anaerobic state, uh -huh. then the um, 
lactic acid gets put back into the Krebs cycle so it can be used as fuel again. Okay. Possibly converted to, now I'm thinking it's possibly being converted to propionate. Okay. All right. So, and it's, uh, there's a lot more to it, but what I find really funny is the people that did the study have a new startup called Fit Biomics. Fit Bionics. Fit Biomics. Bionics. Like microbiome. Biome. Okay. All right. So it's just really interesting to sit there. They're obviously going to market something to try and increase the amount of this particular species. Uh -huh. And what we're going to learn in the next hour is just how complex it is. You really just can't say, oh, I'm going to take this one. Oh, go back to Dr. Satish Rao's study where he showed people with bacterial overgrowth. They tend to take probiotics that are uh, lactate producing probiotics. Okay. That's what almost all the probiotics that you can get over the counter. And he showed that that lactate crossed the blood brain barrier, which is one of the reasons why a lot of these people maybe have some brain fog. It could be intestinal permeability, leaky gut. It could be that the lactic acid is increasing. We may be using the completely wrong species. Maybe we should be using this species to get rid of the lactic acid and produce this propionate. So interesting. Yeah. But it's, it's going to be, it, now it's going to be a race. Now everybody's going to do, oh, this is a probiotic for sleep. This is a probiotic for endurance. And once again, it still has to make it all the way through the intestinal tract and get where it can start uh, dividing more and increasing the diversity. You can't just do one. Remember, you have 100 trillion bacteria in your colon, over 1,000 species. This is, what, this is what a lot of the marketing hype has been around. Oh, we're just going to throw this one at you, and this is going to do all kinds of things. That part doesn't make a whole lot of sense either, though, just to simply take a bacteria or a probiotic just for one desired effect of what you would want, even for sleep. And no doubt that someone will mark it like that. But it all comes down to the biodiversity of that bacteria anyhow. Because you, if you were to load up theoretically on sleep bacteria, well, then wouldn't you just have lethargy all of the time? You, you see what I'm saying? Like, it just doesn't make sense. It's, it's marketing on every, single, on every single line. So this is a mouse study where they said that. So they took humans. They check their poop and they go, oh, these guys have higher, per they have a higher percentage of this particular species. That must mean something. Then we're going to go to rodents. We're going to give it to them. We know that trying to replicate in a mouse model, in a human model is extremely difficult. It's the closest thing we can have because they're, you know, you can't keep humans in cages and, you know, control their diet and do all that, all that other stuff. So there's a lot of other studies that I've seen where they're like, oh, this particular group um, had higher levels of this and they were skinnier. So this is going to be a weight loss probiotic. So it becomes this marketing game with the science being really difficult to prove. They're just bastardizing the, the research though. It doesn't did, make sense to keep doing that. Did you see the article that came out? I guess it was last week where two people died from a, a fecal transplant. No. And, and a, yeah. It's un, super unfortunate. It's the first time that people have had bad outcomes from fecal transplant. You know, everybody gets really excited about the, microbiota transplant and yeah. if you don't know what this is there's a whole new field of science where people are taking one person's poop and they emulsify it and then they put it in one way or the other there's a lot of different ways to do it either through a colonoscope or you can go way into the small bowel and push it through or did, and just uh, just to cover the whole array weren't there some people who were taking frozen capsules of uh, of poop and then and then just basically ingesting it like normal and then the idea was it would thaw yeah. So right? yeah. So the idea would be that it would thaw and it could all the way through. My partner, Dr. Stuart Ackerman, what he was doing is he was getting he was getting stool from this um, NIH grant uh, location where they're collecting stool from people. They do all the they make sure that there's no diseases or anything, and then they they bring it back and then they inject it. Um, it it's frozen. He emulsifies it, goes down with the scope, way into the small bowel, and then just. Um, pushes it beyond the stomach acid, beyond the pancreatic, mm -hmm. where it would normally all get killed mm -hmm. and gets it way down in there as, as far down as he can go. And that's what that's what he was doing. But that's been shut off because the cost of the poop has gone so high that, that there's I don't know I don't there's something happened where regulation started coming in. The cost to test it for all these other things oh became goodness. yeah, it became prohibitive. So now, you know, we all have poop, and now it's a controlled. The FDA is, you know, they made it a. They wanted when the FMT first came out, they wanted everyone to start applying for a new drug indication. It's it, just poop. It's poop, but unfortunately, this is a big setback because two people died. But apparently, the poop had a toxigenic E. coli in it, 
and they didn't realize that, and so they took it one person, gave it to two other people. We use it a lot in the hospital for C. diff infections. Okay. And so if you take antibiotics, not only can you just disrupt your microbiome, mm -hmm. but you can actually allow one particular species to called, dominate. Yeah, to dominate, called C. diff, Clostridium difficile. Yeah. And if you've ever had a relative or you've ever experienced it, it is not fun and hard to get rid of. The fecal transplants were working very, very successful for that. So it's it's unfortunate, but this is the first time that we've had you know bad outcomes. So people are trying to figure out how to work with this microbiome. It's almost like we have the ability to test, but we don't really know what to do with it. Um, Peter Peter Adia was talking about this on one of his podcasts. We we're just saying, yeah, we have this ability to do this big gene mapping. We can do PCR analysis, get all these different species, and oh look, the runners had this. Let's do that. It's just not that simple at least up until this point, unless we crack the code on how to actually figure that part out. It's a whole nother game. You, you find different things that you can detect, but uh, learning how to interpret the analysis is, uh, is a whole nother probably can of worms, just understanding how to apply the science. That happens every day. So what do you think the numbers are if we've lost these two people and they've directly attributed it to the, the transplant itself? Correct. Out of how many? What do you, uh, oh, and, I, don't, I don't know. You don't, you don't just, want to rationalize death, but the truth is it is a number and everything is run through statistics. And it's unfortunate that this would be a setback. But I say that, that we have people who will die today and several that died yesterday and the day before that from opioid abuse. And that's not stopped anybody from administering that. So when you when you look at that and you put it in, in those kinds of of boxes, it is unfortunate. And now we can move forward and, and make certain that this doesn't happen. But. The fact that uh, uh, the really famous kid back in the 80s, Ryan White, who died from AIDS from a blood transfusion. Well, we didn't stop doing blood transfusions because of that. We learned how to get better at doing blood transfusions. Yeah, I think that the it's like all things. If, if, if it can be sensationalized, yeah, then it's going to make the news. And fecal microbial transplants are always something that is going to make the news because people just go, what in the world and they want to read more about it they want to ask questions about it it's been in my field for years and years decades we've been trying to figure out what to actually do with that you know there was the um there was a study that came out i believe it was out of yale where they took poop from skinny mice gave it to fat mice the fat mice got skinny and vice versa mm -hmm. so then that led to this whole study they're actually trying to do this at brigham and young's university mm -hmm. um and i want to say it just got published but it really didn't. It didn't have any weight loss effects. And oh, so, really? Yeah. So it, it worked in mice. Didn't uh -huh. work in humans. Everyone got all excited. You can go around and find skinny people and be like, "Can I? Can I have your poop?" And you know, they, they got all excited that that's what was going to happen. But it looks like it, the results didn't work. It's really interesting. I wonder what the parameters were around it because I I kind of figured that it wouldn't be necessarily that you just simply metabolize food differently. It may have to also. It may also include what do you uh, what kind of foods do you desire by having that type of bacteria inside? So at a small level where mice don't make a whole lot of decisions, I guess you could say, they may just eat a little bit less with that fecal transfer. But maybe the reason why it didn't necessarily work in this one experiment at Brigham Young is because people are still left to their own, their own uh, devices or vices whenever they're out there and they could contaminate the sample that they take by saying, well, I've got the bacteria. I'm still going to go to fill in the fast food chain restaurant or I should lose weight. I've, I've got the bacteria in me now. That's a really good observation because you would almost have to have them in a cage to do this. Because just like we talked about, if your leptin's still being blunted and you're not, you're not going to feel full, you may be taking in more calories. Have you ever done that? Like I did my fitness pal thingy. Jack Carey and I were doing that. Um, <laughs> were you supposed to log all the food? Then yeah. you, you know, you could, it, it became really cumbersome. But I was eating way more calories than I thought. Yeah. Like if you would have said, yeah, man, I'm probably around 2,500 and whatever. And you just keep adding them up. And you're like, oh, my gosh. Oh, I've that handful that. of almonds that you just walk by and throw down. and 100%. You look back and you try to ride off the day like that's the anomaly. And then you realize that that day is just like the day before and the day before that. No, I'm guilty of that. Rhonda Patrick just came out with um, a podcast with her on a telomere specialist. Telomeres are the oh, yeah. kind of tell us our age. Right. It's the end caps of the chromosomes. And mm -hmm. as we age, they decrease. Mm -hmm. 
And they were looking at things that directly affect the telomere length and stress, cortisol, sugar, refined foods, lack of bacterial diversity. Same stuff that we're always talking about actually can speed up the aging process. So telomeres can be damaged each time, basically, that our cells uh, replicate. And what we don't want from all the things you just listed is telomere shortening because that, that enables the cells to age more quickly. And basically, uh, if, as I understand it, the DNA just does not get replicated uh, in the future with the new, the new daughter cells. The with, new younger cells, yeah. Right. But, and and there, that's another complex thing. When we were at IFM, I don't know if you remember that, but there's booths where people check your telomere length. And, oh, yeah, but not only, was it real? Well, that's what Rhonda was talking about when she, there's so many different ways that it can be affected, what lab it is. What are you going to do with the information? And now there's companies out there that are selling products to increase telomerase or decrease telomerase. I don't remember whatever. Yeah, I think it's to increase telomerase, which is an enzyme that kind of protects the telomere. This I'm just going off the top of my head for yeah. this podcast because it gets really, I mean, you know, it's Rhonda Patrick. She sure. gets super sciencey and geeky. And with that, we don't know because sometimes you want shortening because if it's a cancer cell, you want that you want the body to recognize that and it'll go away and that way you don't have because cancer cells will grow so fast that you need that shortening to prevent that from happening so we don't know if trying to mess with telomeres is going to do something like that but the same thing keeps coming around over and over and over if you get sleep you eat right you feed your microbiome what it needs like polyphenols yeah like spore based biotics then decrease the inflammation with CBD then all of that, your body will figure out what to do. So sometimes whenever we talk about articles where people are going, oh, you want to take this one probiotic and you're going to run faster, probably overthinking. Maybe if we just kind of got rid of those refined foods, the emulsifiers and the high sugar and all that stuff. Man, a huge takeaway here is that you you kind of, if you step back, you realize that there are there are real researchers that want to make things happen. The, the crazy unfortunate thing is oftentimes a marketer will simply just take the data and then want to be the first to make something happen rather than make certain that the science is solid or a company has a good product and they just want to race to get out there and get a second product that doesn't necessarily bring value without having the research back behind it. And honestly, that's the, that's the really cool part of being a part of KBMD health and KBS is that we, We've always tried to make certain that the data is solid before do no harm. Be sure that you can help someone before you just turn a product loose. Well, now you're making me feel bad because I'm actually scratching out abdominal discomfort and putting increased valinella and then underneath that, protect your telomeres. <laughs> <laughs> the only product available which will make you faster and younger. Ah, Tron to you. Yes, get your telomeal <laughs> cereal today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It, it's, it, uh, and you don't want to paint a picture of the whole world going dark, but, you, but if you're listening, just protect yourself. When you, if I go to these conferences and you listen to some of these scientists like Walter Longo and these guys that are doing the research, yeah. and like when Rhonda Patrick talks and Sachin Panda, it, it's very, well, this is what we saw. We believe this is this. We can extrapolate that. And it's real gray. It's not like you see... When you're talking to a marketer, we're like, Prevagen will increase your memory. And it's like, well, and wait a minute. Let's back up. Let's, let's look at those studies. These guys that are out there, all these PhDs, they're not that, well, I find them fun. But sometimes it's not that fun to listen to them because right. they don't really land on anything. They're like, nah, we kind of think this is what's happening. Well, and, and it's frustrating to the general public. And, and they're pioneers. I mean, it's probably a lot like uh, Lewis and Clark. They made their way through. They're just mapping. They're not necessarily saying that everything's going to be roses by the time they get out to uh, to the west coast right i mean they were just finding their way there they just basically charted it as it came along yeah we talked last week about all those medical reversals where they were looking at all these yeah. medical reversals they had three they found out in the lancet and new england journal of medicine and jama that when they looked back at trials they showed that 369 straight up medical reversals has taken place like we talked about where we thought estrogen was really good for every woman, take a bunch, and then we realized it was actually increasing heart attacks. So it's really complex, and it's hard to sit there and say, okay, let's look at an article. This bacteria is going to increase running. And they're immediately, 
I mean, I would, I guess I would too, if I was these scientists are like, we need to do a startup right now. So they're doing this startup called Fit Biomics. Yeah, but, so, well, but it's no different than the multi-billion dollar industry that is probiotics. If you talk to Dr. Quigley, that's not how he describes it. He just says, we hope that they, they work great. What do you say? They work great in a Petri dish. Yeah, we just cannot seem to replicate it consistently in humans. Right. And that's the, honestly, that leads right into the next thing. Karan Krishnan is here to explain the real data and the application in humans on what the correct type of probiotic delivery system can do for you. I, this is, you, you've heard me talk like this for so long. Right. This is the first time a microbiologist is going, no, 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 exactly. No, you're, you're right. And here's why. Right. This is, and I studied this. And so I'm really excited to get this kind of information out there and very pleased that we're teaming up with them for our member box so that we can put the two together and you'll see why they work together. But I think it's really cool. Be sure to like and share the Gut Check Project. If there's anything that you wanted to take away from today's show, you can just show the next hour to anybody who's ever been exposed to probiotics ever whatsoever. You'll learn a ton. I know that Ken and I both did. Uh, Karan is uh, he's amazing. He's very intelligent, and he's got real data to show something that you probably never knew about probiotics. Right on. Everybody enjoy. We'll pick it up here in about uh, two minutes, right? Four. Four All right, minutes. see you. This is the only 24-hour, take-anywhere platform dedicated to food and fun. We're Spoony. News this hour from townhall.com. I'm Rich Thomason. Rulings could come down at any time now on two of the Supreme Court's biggest cases of the current high court term. First, whether the Trump administration can add a citizenship question to the 2020 census. Supporters say it's needed to get an accurate count, while critics claim it will lead to an undercount of minorities. The second case involves gerrymandering and whether Democrats in Maryland went too far when they redrew the boundaries of the 6th Congressional District, flipping it from Republican to Democrat. Correspondent Wally Hines. On the heels of last night's debate, 10 more Democratic presidential hopefuls preparing to take to the stage for tonight's showdown. Democratic pollster and strategist Brad Bannon calls Joe Biden the big guy in tonight's debate. I think he's going to be a target in this debate, and he has to demonstrate that he can hold his own, and uh, he can't make a flub. Correspondent Alexandra Jaffe in Miami expects some fireworks during this evening's showdown. Got two of the major frontrunners, Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders, standing side by side on that debate stage. In particular, Bernie Sanders has never been afraid of going after his opponents. We've already seen him go after Joe Biden in the past, and so having them side by side will be an interesting contrast. Among the rest of the field, there are a number of candidates that could also have a breakout moment, but that matchup will be the one to watch. Federal health Experts say the flu vaccine has once again turned out to be a big disappointment. The vaccine did not work against a flu bug that popped up halfway through the flu season. Latest figures show the vaccine only 29% effective overall. Stocks higher on Wall Street this hour. Right now, the Dow is up about five points. The S&P 500 index, 12 points higher, and the NASDAQ better by 46. More on these stories at townhall.com. Now you can fly anywhere in the world and pay discount prices on your airline tickets. Book a flight today to London, Paris, Madrid, or anywhere else you want to go. And pay a lot less guaranteed. Call the International Travel Department right now at low-cost airlines. 800-452-1075. 800-452-1075. That's 800-452-1075. Got an old car? You can donate it, whether it's running or not, to the United Breast Cancer Foundation and save a life. They'll even come and pick it up for free. The United Breast Cancer Foundation has saved hundreds of women's lives through their free or low-cost breast screen exams. But now they need your help. The United Breast Cancer Foundation wants to save more lives through early detection by offering women free or low-cost breast screening exams. And donating your old car, SUV, or truck, whether it's running or not, helps pay for them. 
Plus, you get a charitable tax deduction. Help the United Breast Cancer Foundation save lives by donating your old car, SUV, or truck. Call now for free pickup. 800-245-0823. 800-245-0823. 800-245-0823. Call right now. That number again is 800-245-0823. Never Forgotten Apparel is more than just a premium women's and men's clothing line. It's a movement to remind us to wear American-made and serve those who serve us. Our heroes. Never Forgotten Apparel gives 20% of their total sales to nonprofits that support homeless veterans and off duty firefighters, and 50% to individual veterans and firefighters in need nationwide. Check out NeverForgottenApparel.com. Use promo code MATT, M A T T, and get 15% off your purchase. All right, welcome to the Gut Check Project. As promised, we are here in San Antonio with Kieran Krishnan of Microbiome Labs, makers of Megaspore, and 35 other private labels, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're busy. We're busy. This is a busy man. Yeah. He's got a lot of science behind him. He's got a lot of people that like what they do with probiotics, and it's a completely new way of using probiotics. Ken, what do you think of that? Well, what I think for starters, um, I just got a text from your mom, and it's, get on, get on. <laughs> yes, okay. she's always listening and yeah. correcting, so be careful. <laughs> so, and I do need to apologize yeah. to all the listeners. Just in case you don't like the sound level, it's because I'm doing it, and I don't know exactly how Eric, to do it. <laughs> Eric the engineer? Yeah, what? yeah. Come Eric, on. The, Eric the really, really bad engineer. <laughs> Jeff, uh, Chef Patrick, sorry. This is the best we can do. <laughs> so we're over here at the IFM conference in San Antonio, and we've... You and Eric have met before at different conferences. I love the work that you guys are doing. Thank you. Yo, let's just start with this. Who yeah. are you? Yeah, good question. So we are a band of super nerds that, love it. Yeah, that, that are battling the revolution um, that is going on within the gut, right? So we, we know that, um, and, and this is the way I explain it to people all the time. If you look at the human construct, we're essentially a microbial system. We are, um, the fancy word for it, for those that want to impress their friends, is holobiome. 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 We are a super organism. Uh, we're no more can we think of ourselves as a collection of organ systems of the brain and, you know, lungs and heart and all that connected by neurons and vessels. We are a, um, a walking, talking rainforest is what we are, right? We are an organism made up of thousands of other organisms that have to work in concert to perpetuate the health of the collective. That's what the that's what a holobiome is, right? It's like a rainforest. So if you look at a rainforest, the canopy, the floor, every part has a different ecology. And if any of those ecologies get damaged, the entire rainforest suffers. So we can trace back now virtually every chronic disease to some disruption in our ecology. So in our thinking, we are a microbial construct. We're made up of microbes. We've taken this amazing microbial construct and we've put ourselves in an antimicrobial world, right? So we've really shot ourselves in the foot like crazy. Everything around us destroys our inner ecology and that leads to disease. So we're here fighting that whole problem and revolution of bringing back our ecology. Now. Bringing back the ecology, fixing the rainforest. I love that. Yeah. I always talk. I always tell my patients about. I've never used the word holobiome. I say multibiome because let's yeah. quit talking about just your microbiome. There's yeah. other things going on. You're exactly right. We are. Do we live for the multibiome, or does the multibiome live for us? Yeah. You know, if you if you look at the evidence and if you look at the history, essentially we are an accident because of the multibiome, right? So. Even the human cell is constructed of ancient bacteria, right? The, the eukaryotic human cell is basically a construct of ancient bacteria, which, are, which make up our, um, our uh, what's the word? I'm, I'm having a brain fart. Um, the energy production of the cell. The mitochondria. The mitochondria, yeah, sorry. So ancient bacteria were essentially individual mitochondria that all kind of came together to form a eukaryotic cell, build a nucleus around it. Oh, and, so you, know, you guys DNA. think way back. Way yeah. back. We're going back to the beginning of time, right? Like where all of this started from. Because if we don't understand that, then how do we understand how oh, we function? Oh, that's beautiful. Right? So just going back to the simplicity of it, because 
as it turns out, when we start looking at these unique multicellular organisms that we are, and we're a small population of what's living in the universe or in the in the world, we don't know what's living in the universe, but what's living on Earth, um, most of it are single cellular organisms, right? Most of the living entities are single cellular. When we look at multicellular organisms, when we look at how multicellular organisms um, communicate from one cell to the other, all of those rules are written by single cellular organisms. You know, hormones, for example, most people are surprised to know that our microbiome in the gut produces virtually every hormone our endocrine system can make, right? All of the serotonins and dopamines, all of the stress hormones, all of uh, insulin, um, estrogen, testosterone, all of that is made by the microbiome as well. And the, and the thinking is that, that our microbiome actually taught our endocrine system how to make those hormones. So the bacteria provided the DNA um, code to our endocrine system to figure out how to make hormones. And bacteria have been using hormones for millions of years to communicate with one another. And so we now use hormones to communicate within our body itself. This is so fascinating yeah. because in my field, the microbiome is a relatively new concept to yeah. traditional medicine. And here you're talking about that the microbiome actually taught our bodies how to organize, how to live in the world, how to move. That is fascinating because yeah. when we think about it, the way that other people talk about, it, oh, it's so complex, we don't know that. You just dumbed it down to, yeah. oh, no, it's actually so simple because it, it started be. yeah. with just one cell that's there. It's Eric, what are you, are you following this here? I'm following it. What I think is awesome is it's way, it, it does seem like that it's so simple. However, it's not just the dumbed down version of, well, you just need some good bacteria. It's yeah. way, way, way different than that. You have to understand, I've for a long time kind of felt like that we are vehicles for this bacteria. Mm -hmm. yeah. And everywhere that you go, you're basically you're kind of being driven yeah. by what it is. I mean, the, the chemical messengers that you referenced, yeah. we interpret that, but is it really completely ours to interpret it? Not, not necessarily. Yeah, well, and you know, there's evidence of bacteria making us do things, right? And, and you would think that there is some altruistic reason for them to do it. For example, there are certain types of bacteria within your microbiome that make you more social that make you go out, actually give you the, the motivation to go out and meet people. Um, and the reason for that, and you think, oh, why do the bacteria want me to be more social? Well, that's one of the ways that they transfer from host to host, is that if you're not social, if you're antisocial and you sit back, and back in the day, if you sat back in your cave all the time by yourself, you're really not going out there and spreading this micro, this microbiome. Um, there, are, there are bacteria out there that um, can actually change your outlook on life. There was a study looking at women who took probiotics versus women that didn't. And they took uh, women that took probiotics and then a group that didn't, and they showed them a bunch of pictures and they were measuring brainwave activity. And they were showing them like really stressful uh, pic pictures, things that would bother them normally. And they found that the women that took probiotics on a regular basis actually had a less intense emotional response to those pictures. So their outlook on life seemed a little bit better than the ones that did. You know, and so these microbes are dictating a lot of how we even respond to the world around us. So this is fascinating because as a gastroenterologist, we always, I always try and get people to feed their microbiome. Yeah. In other words, eat the diet that your bacteria really should have. Totally. Have a diverse bacteria. And now we have the highest incidence of anxiety, yeah. of depression. I mean, and all we're doing is just throwing more and more drugs at it, trying yeah. to get that to be corrected. When the reality is if we could balance the bacteria and now, you know what? And you know what I really like about this? This is an excuse for me to go to Vegas with my buddies. I'm going to be like, hey, the bacteria are telling me to get out, honey. <laughs> totally, I'm, yeah. I'm doing and this for health. <laughs> that is one of the best places to swap bacteria. Yeah, that's, exactly. a, that's, a, is, yeah. that's a microbial yeah. Vegas. I'm going to Vegas to keep away disease, honey. Yeah, especially at 3 in the morning when you're laid out on the yeah. sidewalk from yeah. all the activity. Yep. That's, that's one of the exchanges. The I do have a question, though. So the study, which I find completely fascinating, would it did it matter what the delivery system is? And the reason I ask that is because we we oftentimes uh, can through the practice we talk about not all probiotics number one are created equal, yeah. mm -hmm. and even more than that, the delivery system, which is how we met, yeah. is so. Kind of talk about that. Why does it matter how a probiotic is delivered? Yeah, and uh, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, yeah. So that's critical because um, in large part. You know, what we saw when we started studying probiotics and the way we even got into this space is... Yeah, can I, I, just, a, I'm gonna, I just want to know a little more of the history. How yeah. did you end up even looking at the bacteria? At the whole thing. Yeah. So um, I, when I got into the natural space, so I'm a microbiologist by training and I was uh, a uh. research nerd. 
And I, I had a big, um, you know, interest in the whole natural health space. And I would go to places like GNC and I'd buy products and I'd ask them about their studies. And they had no, I mean, most products don't have studies on the marketplace. Um, and I started questioning companies like, why don't you have more studies? And really what I ended up finding out is that it's too expensive to do clinical trials, right? A vitamin company can't afford a half a million dollar trial to figure out the product doesn't work, yeah. right? And pharma companies do that all day long, right? They have one in a thousand compounds that is successfully enter market, but they'll spend millions of dollars on those 999 that don't do anything uh, or do something really bad. Uh, but nutritional companies just can't afford that. So I said, there's got to be a way we can change the paradigm of how you do clinical trials to, to make it more affordable and make it more functional for nutritional companies. Number one, forget all the disease outcomes, right? So if I have a compound, a natural compound that can reduce blood pressure, if I did a $100,000 study on blood pressure, the problem with it is I can't talk about it because you FDA doesn't allow you to go out there and say, you know, this this extract reduces blood pressure. Well, let's talk right? about that really quick also, because, you know, because we're in the same space. I I like I started yeah. um, as a gastroenterologist doing pharmaceutical research. And when you start talking about these products before you even get to the point where you can say what it is, you have to go to an IRB yep. and apply for an NDI and all these other acronyms totally. that make it almost prohibitive yeah. for somebody that's trying to be altruistic and go, look, I just want to know if this works. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And, and the outcomes, you know, what, like what, what are we really figuring out and studying here? And so what I did is taking blood pressure an ex as an example, rather than looking at the, the final outcome of, um, you know, reducing the pressure in the vein using a cuff like anyone else would, I looked at structure or functional changes in the, in the pathway to reducing blood pressure. So looking at changes to angiotensin enzyme and so on. You know, so looking at structure function change that lead to that outcome rather than looking for the outcome itself. And, and the FDA allows you to talk about structure function changes in the body, right? So that's how I figured. And, and with those kind of biomarker changes, you don't need as many subjects. You can do smaller oh, pilot that's studies. Super smart. Right. And, and we were able to do, so I was doing all of these studies with eight, 10, 15 patients, giving companies an idea of what their product might do in the system, what the ultimate outcome might be, looking at small changes in the pathways to those products. And so were you drawing blood levels of angiotensin? Yeah, exactly. Things? Yeah, okay. angiotensin, angiotensin converting enzyme. We we're looking at things like rheological measures on the blood, uh, the viscosity of the blood using this machine called a rail log uh, that me measures real time viscosity of the blood and what work it takes to pump that blood through through the vascular system. Where were you doing you know? this at? So, uh, so then I opened a CRO, a clinical research organization. Oh, okay. Uh, my mom is a medical doctor. Um, she's listening, by the way, for correct pronunciation, yes. as you said. <laughs> so, mom, hi, how are you? Um, so she's a medical doctor. I made her my principal investigator. And uh, we opened in the south side of Chicago a clinical research organization. And I started working with supplement companies and saying, hey, I can design a clever study for you to figure out what your product is doing. It's not going to cost you much. And you can pilot it. You know, if you do a pilot study for 20 grand and you get some idea that your product has a benefit, then it's easier to invest 50 or 70 into a bigger study because then you know you can get the marketing benefit of doing that, right? But companies are just not going to spend 100 grand right off the bat and figure out the product doesn't do anything. So I created clever pilot studies and things to give people an idea. And from doing that, I started getting companies inviting me to come on their board, scientific board, or helping them with product development in the supplement world. Um, and that's how I got into the supplement world. So it's purely from the backside, the research, um, and having this research organization. So in a field where there's really little to no research, you started with the research it, and absolutely, worked your way yeah. into the field. Worked it, worked it in. And, and really, I came to immediately find out who the best companies were because 98% of them were like, yeah, we're not really interested in doing a clinical <laughs> trial. I'm like, but it's 20 grand and you could figure out whether your product's actually making any change in the body. I'm like, we don't really want to know that. You know? <laughs> and I think a lot of it is they don't want to know it does, it's not doing anything. Well, so. I think a lot of it is, and we have, we have discussed this before on the show, that you know they did that analysis where they looked at products that they pulled them off the shelf and yeah. DNA analysis showed that almost 80% uh, of them did not have what was in the capsule, what was totally. on the label. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And, that, and, and we know that since we've been in process, and you know this as well, that 
unless you see where it's being sourced, yep. how it's being extracted, how it's moved over. Yeah. There are so many players in a chain when it's a mass commodity totally. that yeah. you may end up not having at all what you think you have in that capsule. Yeah, and you have to test it at every step of the way, too. You know, when, when you bring the raw material in before you blend it in with other stuff, um, after you encapsulate it, every step you have to do the testing again to verify that it's still what you want it to be. Um, but, you know, there was a large multinational company um, that, that found it, and I was working with them on product development. And they basically came and said, you know, w w they were a pretty big probiotic company to begin with, and, uh, but they were getting a lot of competition in the retail space from new probiotics coming in. And a lot of those probiotics are what I call the kitchen sink probiotics, where you just kind of throw everything in it, you know. We're just going to put 19 strains in this. And you're, and I sit in these meetings and go, why 19 strains? Like, why did you pick these strains? And they go, well, our competitor has 17, so yes. it would be a little bit better. And you probably right? saw the evolution like I did, where it started out as like, we got... One million colony <laughs> right. forming units, and then the next person's ten, and then that's twenty. Totally. Now it's like we have one trillion yeah. units in this one <laughs> capsule. You know, yeah. Do you have somebody actually plate counting that and making right. sure? You know, but it just they becomes don't. a marketing thing. It's all marketing, and I, I would sit down in these because I, you know, like I mentioned, I became part of advisory boards or companies, and I'd sit down in these meetings where they're developing products, and they would go, "We want uh, fifteen strains and fifty billion." And I, and my first reaction is. Number one, why 15 strains? Why 50 billion? Like, do you have some sort of study I'm not aware of that shows 50 billion works and 30 billion doesn't? And they go, well, no, this is the closest competitor. They have 35 billion. So we want to be just that much more, <laughs> right? And then here's where it really <coughs> becomes bad. It's like they have a company that they're benchmarking next to and, and they want to be higher count than that company, but they want to be same price point. So if you're putting more in and you want to be at the same price, the more that you put in ends up being lower quality because you can't spend as much on it, right? So now you've got 20, 25% more ingredients in their higher amounts, and yet you have to be at the same price point. So you have to go with a lower value ingredient product. So now we've got things like lactobacillus acidophilus, which is the number one probiotic strain in any product, right? You find it everywhere in, in probiotic products. You can buy a tanker load of it for like three grand. Really? A tanker load of it. It's insane, yeah. And so when you're in the probiotic world, I'm not in that world, yeah. when you do start buying the raw materials for probiotics, how is that actually done? Yeah. Does it come as like a, like a culture bath? Is, is it an agar? What yeah. is it? So I'm so glad you asked me that question because when we saw that study from, um, from UC Davis that, sh that tested the products on the market by DNA, yeah. right? And they showed that the vast majority of products that they tested did not have the right strains in the capsule that was claimed on the label. And then you ask yourself, well, how in the world does that happen, right? Like, it's like launching a product that says vitamin C and there's nothing but vitamin A in it, yeah. right? Like, how do you make that mistake? So it all comes back to how you buy probiotics. So if I'm a probiotic company and I'm gonna to put together a product, I go, okay, I want these 10 strains in it. I'll call my ingredient distributor and I'll say, I want acidophilus, rhamnosus, uh, you know, casei, whatever the strains are, um, ship me a drum of each. It'll come to you as a drum. You open the drum and it's just a powder. And there's no way you know that this is actually lactobacillus exactly. acidophilus. There is something called a C of A, a certificate of analysis from the manufacturer that says you have now purchased lactobacillus acidophilus. But how do you know that, right? That it's just powder, it's, you can't tell. In order to really verify that, you have to send that powder to some university or lab to do full DNA analysis in order to verify that it actually is. But that's not part of the regular, the GMP regulations. So nobody's doing it. Right, so manufacturer sends you a drum of powder and they say, this is lactobacillus acidophilus and you go, okay, yes it is. And you put it in your capsule and you put the product on the shelf. So like when it no comes idea. there, how do you even know that it's even viable also? I've always right. wondered this because people say, is it actually? Yeah, now some companies will do a plate count. So they'll take a, a known amount of it, like a, um, like a gram, mix it in water and plate it to see if it actually grows. Um, the problem is something is gonna grow because there is bacteria in there, you just don't yeah. know what bacteria, yeah. right? So you look at the colonies and you can't tell what bacteria it is from the colonies, but you go, oh great, something's growing, it must be fine. And then you put it in the capsule and you put it in the, on the shelf and you have no idea what's in the product. Wow. You know? No idea. So that's how the typical probiotics are there, but yeah. you have something very unique. Yeah. Now let's get to Eric's question that he yeah. was gonna say. Totally, so, um, so when that multinational company um, hired us 
to do research for them. Uh, we approach the probiotic industry purely from an objective standpoint to do research for them to figure out what is going to be the next generation of probiotics. So we started studying all the stuff in the market and we started to figure out that the vast majority of probiotics in the market are dying in the stomach, whether if they have bacteria in it, they're dying in the stomach, you're basically pooping it out eight hours and 12 hours later. Um, they're not, most of them are dying on the shelf if, if, if they even get to your stomach. And then I even had the, um, you know, the approach of going to health food stores and just asking people, I would go, what are your best probiotics? And the clerks would always point me to the stuff in the refrigerator, right? And I would go, and as a microbiologist, I'm always confused, like, why are they sitting in the refrigerator? So I'd ask them and I'd go, why are they in the refrigerator? And they say, well, these are the highest quality, they're live culture, and to keep them as live culture, you gotta refrigerate them, right? And they'd say, okay, and when you buy them, take them home and put them in the refrigerator. And I'd go, okay, so if they sat on the shelf, um, they would die, and they'd go, yes, that's why, make sure you keep them in the refrigerator. I'm like, okay, it's 70 degrees in the shelf, it's 98.6 degrees in the body, how is it gonna survive there? We can't sit on the shelf at 70 degrees. And they never had an answer, you know? So to me, I was like, all this stuff that's in the refrigerator makes absolutely no sense at all. And so we wanted to take a completely different approach to it. We started going, where did our ancestors get their probiotics from, right? We have this really intimate relationship between us and bacteria. They conduct many functions for us. That doesn't occur overnight. So there must be this long-term relationship with bacteria. And we look at our ancestors, they were smart enough to eat dirt, right? They didn't clean their environment. They didn't sterilize their environment. And so um, we started focusing on environmental bacteria. Now, the thing is, most environmental bacteria can't act as probiotics because most of them will die in the stomach as well. So we started kind of honing in on what bacteria we would come across in the environment that actually had some special function that could act as a probiotic. The first one that we came across were these bacillus endospores. So these are unique bacteria that belong in the gut, but they leave the gut through defecation. And when they go out in the environment, um, when they go out in the environment, they go into the spore form. And because they're in the spore form, they put like an armor-like coating around themselves, and they can use that armor-like coating to survive through the gastric system and actually end up in the intestines. Oh. One second. Just go ahead and yeah. keep talking. No, 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 don't talk. No, no. Okay. okay. I think it's still going. I've done this during podcasts. I, and the podcast always keeps going, so. Okay. It's so recording. Yeah. Is it... Did you get it? Yeah, I did. did it, is it saying no? It didn't it. It's this memory I asked. I said, my guy does goes slow. It's still running. Okay. Okay. Let's see. And can I go ahead? Testing, testing, one, two. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, so let's get back to the, can you describe what a spore, the first spore biotic that you guys wanted to... Right. You look at. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we were we were trying to find these environmental bacteria that had this special characteristic of being able to cover themselves with this spore coating so that they can actually naturally survive through the gastric system. Um, and we we looked at research and we went to the biggest best researcher in the spore world. It's Dr. Simon Cutting out of Royal Holloway University, of London. Oh wow. Yeah. So he's been studying spores and he runs the international spore event and all of that. So he's a super spore nerd, basically, right? Um, and, and then there's some, um, there's some really interesting stuff that he's doing using spores as a vaccine delivery vehicle, which we should talk about at some point. Um, uh, but, but basically, we went to him and we licensed a bunch of spores. Oh. And we said, we want your spores that we know function in the gut. And so we licensed five spores for him, and we looked at the function of each one, and we saw that each one did a little bit of a different role in the gut. And so we put together the first multi-spore-based probiotic with the idea that these spores will, number one, actually survive through the gastric system and go in the gut and start making a change to the rest of the microbiome. So as a microbiologist, can you explain to everybody that, so the bacteria gets into a spore form, it can tolerate yeah. cold, hot, it just waits. Yeah. What does it wait for? Ah, so it's waiting for a molecular handshake, I call it, with the mucosal cells in the small intestine. So the moment it gets right into the, the duodenum, or duodenum as some cool people say it, um, I don't know how gastroenterologists say it, duodenum or duodenum? Uh, good. The upper gut. <laughs> the upper part of the gut. Yeah. Uh, so it gets into that upper part of the gut, and, um, and, we have, and they have receptors on the outside of the spore that tell them that they're in the gut mucosal tissue. 
So that binding, the temperature, um, and then some nutrients will get them to bust out of the spore state. You know, and, but it can remain in the spore state outside of the body for literally millions of years. The oldest spore found was, fo was found in uh, fossilized amber bee in the gut of the bee. Um, they, were, they actually found a whole ancient bee that was fossilized. They drilled into the gut to find what the substrates were in the gut. They pulled out some spores and they could still plate it. It was still alive. 250 million years old. <laughs> That's insane. 250 million. That sounds like Jurassic Park stuff. Totally it Jurassic really Park, yeah. It does. So let's get back to this, because the way that I've kind of um, been telling my patients, the reason why I like spore-based yeah. is that because that spore can actually survive both the acidic environment and it starts that handshake in the small mm -hmm. bowel, yeah. but it's really meant to really proliferate where your real microbiome is. Totally, right? so yeah, in the large the, bowel. Yeah, yeah, towards the end of the small bowel. Yeah. So it starts the handshake, and by the time it makes it down there, it's fully awake. So it's totally. like a, I almost liken that, if we're going to start talking about movies, that's almost like, you know, time travel, where you get in the pod, and as you get closer, <laughs> yeah. you start to wake up, so. <laughs> totally, yeah, and, and so it's making its way through the small bowel. What's interesting is it makes a, um, an interesting, a couple of stops in the small bowel. Really? So, yeah, so we always um, encourage people to take it with food. The reason we do that is in the presence of food, the bacteria produce digestive enzymes. So the spores are the largest commercial producers of protease, amylase, cellulase enzymes. Like most of the enzymes that you find from, uh, from fermentation that are the big commercial enzymes are produced actually by spores. So all these enzymes that you can get at these functional places, they're actually yeah. produced by spores. They're not produced because I was told that they were plant-based enzymes. Yeah, so, so some of them are extracted from plant. Most of them are made by... Uh, fungal fermentation or spore fermentation. I did not yeah. know that. Yeah, they make them. They make the enzymes, and so they'll they'll help you digest your food. They'll hang out for a little while in the small bowel with the food there. They'll produce all of these digestive enzymes to help you break down your food. Then they'll move down, and the part that's really interesting um, is that they move to the uh, to the ileum where the Peyer's patches are. Yeah. And they interact with the Peyer's patches no and help kidding. regulate T and B cell uh, proliferation. So they are some of the strongest proliferators of T and B cells. How I, we, I hate to do this. We are up against the break. We're going to be joined in the second half hour. We are yeah. not don't forget, if you're listening right now to Gut Check Project, you are looking at Kiran Christian talking about high spore based probiotics are the best way for you to consume probiotics. Hang on, gut check project, back at you. Okay, break here. We'll come back and then do the twenty eight thirty starting here. Don't lose your train of thought. So I'll just reintroduce, and we're going to start right back at it. It's really awesome. Thank you. Yeah, of course. You need to check the camera. Now, that, that part's going well. Now I know to mind this also. Just, <laughs> just, just touch the mouse pad once in a while. Yeah, I am. Okay, so uh, we're going to start again. Ron, you're listening here. Uh, bar count 796.4. Three, two, and five, and go. Okay, we are back with the last half hour of Gut Check Project. We are joined by Karen Krishnan, who is going to completely change your mind on how to consume probiotics, what they can do for you. Take it away, because we just, unfortunately, had to take a crazy break just to... Yeah, uh, do it. So, right, right when we left for the break, yeah. you were talking about the incredible journey of the sport. This should be a yeah. children's book. Totally, totally. Yes. You should write a children's <laughs> we book. We are working on an animated short. I love this, it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the incredible journey of the spore bacteria. So, <laughs> yeah. now you were just talking about the ilium and the where ilium, it goes yeah. there, and what does it do there? So, in the payers patches, which is, you know, one of the biggest areas of sampling in your gut for your gut immune system... Um, they actually interact with the, with the immune cells in the payers patches, and they upregulate your T cell and B cell expression very significantly. And you see that through the, the payers patches are connected to the mesenteric lymph node, and you see that proliferation of your immune cells throughout the body. And in fact, you get a lot of anti-inflammatory cytokine expression right at that juncture. So because the spores are what we call immunogenic, they're so strong at interacting with their pair patches. That's why I, I prefaced it before by saying he's developing vaccines using the spores as a delivery vehicle. Oh. So here's how that works. This is fascinating, right? So they, they're able to take the spore and take like a tetanus antigen, for example. Instead of doing a tetanus vaccine where you inject it, you stick it on the spore and you swallow it. The spore takes it all the way down to the ileum, to the pair patches, and presents that antigen to the Holy immune God. cells. And you get a more robust in, uh, uh, adaptation response to that than injecting it in your arm or your thigh or anywhere else you would do it. 
Um, and, and so, like, for example, they did a study on women where they used it as a vehicle for tetanus uh, vaccination. And they, they gave them a spore with the tetanus antigen on it. Within two hours of swallowing it, they could find anti-tetanus antibodies in the vaginal canal of the, of the female subjects. That's how fast it proliferated through the immune system. And they found the antibodies that go against that tetanus um, antigen, even in places like the vaginal canal or the upper respiratory tract. You know, that's how important it is. And that's why I tell people to let their kids eat boogers. <laughs> right, so it comes down to that, you know. And I've been thinking about boogers for some time because, uh, and I think about all these evolutionary behaviors. Right? Now, do you recommend them eating their own or others? Well, I think I think if we really want to do it right, we gotta have booger parties. <laughs> we gotta have family booger parties, neighborhood booger parties. But when you think about it, like I have a five-year-old and an eight-year-old, and each of them, when they were between the age of three and my five-year-old, still in that phase a little bit. You know, you see them standing there, and it's so natural for them to pick their nose, pull out this really disgusting looking thing and why is the instinct to put it in your mouth right and you lose that instinct after a certain amount of time right so i've been thinking about boogers for a while and then I'm, i i realized that what is a booger it's a vaccine it's an oral vaccine you pick up viruses molds all of that stuff in your upper respiratory tract it's now covered with iga and mucus and all that and then when you swallow it it goes into your system and it gets sampled by the Peyer's patches and the ileum and that gives you the immunity and the adaptation to that. Same with the whole mucociliary elevator. It's designed for you guys for, to pull up stuff from your lungs and all that and swallow it, right? And the whole swallowing I, um, concept is important because all this stuff is sampled in the gut immune system. Um, so the spores act in that way as well. So we've had success, for example, with people that have dairy sensitivity or, or an allergic reaction to certain food compounds. And when we eliminate that food from the person's diet, allow their gut to heal a little bit, bring down the inflammation, then we have docs that will slowly introduce the food in really minuscule amounts with the spores because the spores then kind of present the food antigen to the pears patches and upregulate your adaptive immune response so you build oral tolerance to the food. So we can readapt the way our body responds to things. All right, so this is... I'm. Uh, blown away here because this is the first time I've ever thought about this. I just want to I want to reiterate a couple things here. So a spore based probiotic. Yeah. I was getting it wrong. I was thinking okay probiotic like everybody else we're just they're good for you. You're just feeding your own microbiome. Yeah. We know I we worked with uh, the PhD out of Texas Tech where he was trying to develop a probiotic for C. diff infection, mm -hmm. yeah. and he had a mouse model, and he goes, it's incredible, it completely gets rid of it. Is that Hale? Hale, yes, yes, Dr. Hale. And he was telling me just how amazing it was. Yeah. The only problem is, it didn't work if they gave it orally. The yeah. only time it worked is when they they stuck a catheter in the ileum and injected it, uh, yes. which means it wasn't surviving until it gets to the colon. Mm -hmm. What I'm hearing is the spore-based probiotics have a completely different mechanism than I was thinking. It yeah. isn't like they're just populating. They're presenting. They're truly vehicles. They are. Getting yeah. down there and presenting to the immune system. Yeah. So in the ileum, which is the part of the small intestine that, that then dumps into the colon, um, it does a lot of important things. That's Sorry. just like you're talking about. Yeah. It's got those pyrus patches, which has B and T cells, and it presents it. That's where you um, absorb B12 and a lot yeah. of other things. Yeah. This is absolutely incredible. I've never thought of it. Yeah. Why didn't I know about this before? You, you know, um, we've been so silent about it. We've been uh, slowly tinkering in the lab with all of this stuff. And then just in the last couple of years, bringing all this out. And, and we haven't had the opportunity to sit down and talk as well. So um, it's, it's all coming out. So in the research world, there's a lot about this. That's why we've been developing these, uh, not we have, but Dr. Cutting has been developing all of these vaccine uh, delivery vehicles with the spores because it does so much with respect to the immune system. Um, one of the things it does is a Th1, Th2 balance. We see that quite a bit. So people who tend to be very inflammatory and respond to everything in an inflammatory manner, we can actually bring back the Th2 adap uh, Th1 adaptive response in those people. Uh, we see a, a balance of interleukin-10, which is a cytokine that brings down inflammatory response versus uh, bringing that up and then bringing down it to look at six, you know, all of these balances that we see. See, we see this so in my world, yeah. in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, we always talk about that, one being a TH1, one being a TH2, yeah. and then you have all these 
interleukins happening and TNF yeah. alpha and interfering gammas and stuff. And then you have drug companies going, oh, it must be this TNF. Yeah. Let's do an infusion that costs 10,000 a month. Yeah. And it's the exact same thing that we always talk about with Atron Teal. Mother Nature still does it better. Totally. All yeah. day long. Absolutely. Uh, Mother Nature always does. And, and this is, you know, um, millions of years in the making and it's just sitting out here in, in the environment for us. I always say that, you know, we were just smart enough to, to, to understand that we should look to nature for what nature has created and then just be smart enough to use it. That's all we can be, right? We can never outsmart nature. And we see that happening all the time in the, in the um, infant formula world, which always drives me crazy because, you know, for literally 100 years, m multi billion dollar companies have been working on infant formula to try to match it to mother's milk. And they can't. We know if you feed your baby infant formula versus breastfeeding natural mother's milk, they're going to have a lot of metabolic and other immune issues down the road. They tend to have higher degrees of uh, higher incidence rate of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, allergies, and so on. Despite the billions of dollars that have gone in to figure out how to create infant formula, we know that you cannot match the millions of years of evolution of mother's milk. Right? Nature knows what it's doing. We just have to kind of follow, be smart enough to figure out what nature has offered us and then use it. And that's, that's kind of our focus on probiotics. That is so fascinating. The um, So like in my world, we don't see autoimmune disease, Crohn's, and all sort of colitis in third world countries. Right. And the myopic view was, oh, it's because they have parasites there. We don't have it here. Right. So they have tried multiple times to feed people whipworms yeah. in the hopes of tricking the immune system. The reality is they're getting a lot more spore-based stuff what it is. than they are getting parasites because we've never been able to actually say, okay, it's parasites, yeah, so I, it's probably the spore-based aspect of it. It is, and, and the spores control the rest of the microbiome too. That's what we were really interested on is, you know, like the product we have, the Megaspore has five strains in it, and the biggest question we always get is, well, it's just five strains, Shouldn't we need, don't we need more, right? And we say, no, it depends, it, it depends on what the strains are doing in the system. We've always had this idea that the, that the five strains can actually get in and significantly change the presence of a lot of other bacteria in the gut. Right? We think of them as the orchestrators of the microbiome. And in fact, we've kind of outsourced this function to these bacteria because there's very little control that we have within our own system to manage the ecology in our gut. Right? If our ecology goes off because of a single round of antibiotics, there's very little our own body can do to try to bring it back. Right? That's all done and controlled by bacteria. And so um, we know that these spores have been in the prescription market since 1952 by big companies like Sanofi Aventis in Germany, France, Latin America. Yeah, they've like, been prescription drugs, actually, yeah, what? for treating dysentery and for treating gut <clears throat> infections because they're so good at going in using something called quorum sensing where bacteria read the microbial environment. They look at other bacterial chemical signatures. They'll find pathogenic bacteria, they'll sit next to them, and they produce upwards of 24 different antibiotics in that little space to kill off those pathogenic bacteria. Right, so they have the capability of doing that. And if we have time, we'll talk about a funny camel dung story of how this was even discovered. We are going to uh, make time for We have to make time for camel dung. <laughs> Always. There's a, there's a general rule in this show. <laughs> camel dung. We, <laughs> we, we don't skip on camel dung. We don't skip on camel dung. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but what was fascinating to, to us about it is if these microbes have the capability of identifying and bringing down the levels of pathogenic bacteria, they've got to be able to do the opposite of increasing the growth of good bacteria. So we did two studies that are going to be published sometime in the next three months, where we saw when you add these spores into the microbiome, it increases the diversity of the microbiome by almost 45%. Really? Yeah. Five strains can bring back the growth of over 300 other strains. Right? And, and it increases the diversity by, by two measures. One is richness, which is how many different bacteria are present within the sample, and two, uniformity. It actually brings back uniformity to the microbiome. Nothing else has been shown to be able to do that. You know, and it's, it's almost mind-blowing that you would think you can add five strains and somehow these strains that weren't in your gut previously are now there. Where do they come from is a question, right? And so we dug into that a little bit too. And we found out that in, in certain people, these microbes are there, but they're at such low levels, they're completely undetectable by our, by our research methods. Even by things like qPCR, which is a really sensitive method, we couldn't find certain strains in, in, in people, and then we give them 
probiotic, and next thing you know, there, there are hundreds of billions of that same bacteria now present in the gut. So they were there, they're just there at such tiny amounts that they're non-functional. And the spores go in and they identify the, the bacteria that are beneficial but are suffering, and they increase their growth. So when they get in, when those spores make it to the colon, do they then go out of, uh, they, they, they actually become part of the crowd, or do they remain in spore form, continue? Yeah, so they, like yeah, they become vegetative state, which is their growing state. So it's interesting, their life cycle. So what they do is, uh, when they first get in the duodenum, they're in the spore form, which is how it is in the product. And then when they get in the duodenum, they do that molecular handshake, they come out of the spore form. In much of the small intestine, they are actually in that vegetative state, which is their active multiplying state. They're doing all of these functions. When they get to the ileum, where the, where the pears patches are, they go back into the spore form. Because as it turns out, they are more immunogenic in the spore form than in the vegetative form. Hmm. So that is fascinating when we found that in one of our studies, is that they are vegetative state, when they get to that part of the intestine, they go, oh, I know where I am, and they go back to the spore form because they're now interacting with the immune cells in the spore form. And then when they go past the ileum, when they enter the proximal part of the large bowel, they go back into the vegetative state, they come out of the spore form again. Now, when they're at the very end of the lar large bowel, when they're terminal and the large bowel and they're about to get pooped out, they go back into the spore form again because they know they're entering the outside world. Because then they're gonna. And then they're, they're gonna be in the environment, you know, with their things like UV radiation and all that. Kind of so stuff. why doesn't every single bacteria in the world do this? Um, so smart. these, yeah, this this is smart, and this is coevolution over millions of years of these bacteria that we've been swallowing inadvertently. Um, and then the way I think about it is. You know, the, the world became covered with microbes, right? Those are the first living things on Earth. We know that for a fact. Um, and we'll actually talk about something called panspermia, and it doesn't sound as, as interesting as, <laughs> as it actually is, but... That um, sounds like some bacteria <laughs> being swapped. It's, it's exactly. That's Vegas kind of thing that happens. <laughs> panspermia. It sounds like a club in Vegas, <laughs> right? Welcome um, to panspermia. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, Rady's night in panspermia. <laughs> um, but wait, so panspermia, the idea of panspermia is the building blocks of life, the nucleic acids and proteins that started the cellular development in life must have come from outer space, must have come from meteorites that crash into the earth because you can find nucleic acids and amino acids on samples of meteorites that have crashed into the earth. So the thinking is that where did this like seed for cellular life come from? And it came during the time when the Earth was bombarded with all of these meteorites, right? Um, and so they did a study to see if there are any microbes that exist on Earth today that could have survived interstellar travel on a meteorite from, say, somewhere like Mars. And they did a study and they found that these spores, the very ones that we work with, could survive six years in interstellar travel and actually re-enter on a meteorite and be some of the foundations of, of cellular life on Earth. And this is a published study showing, so the spores that we're working with could have been the origins of life on Earth. It's not, it's not outlandish, outlandish to even think that. You know, so it's, it's so fascinating that they've been here way longer than we have. Uh, we saw that in the evidence of the spores in the, uh, in the honeybee, you know, that are, that are 250 million years old. They found spores in a cave in Southern California in salt crystals that they could melt out of the salt crystals and still grow them, and they were over 50 million years old, and they're still alive. They've been here since the beginning, and you know our idea is that we've been swallowing them inadvertently as humans, being in this uh, in this earth because they're everywhere, they're ubiquitous, and then some of them develop this evolutionary mechanism of being able to survive through the gastric system, and then actually start orchestrating the ecology in us, which for a long time looked a lot like the ecology in the soil. Right, there's, there is resonance between the ecology in the soil and the ecology in the gut. Uh, and that's part of why our world is so toxic, because our soil is dead, and so our food is dead, and our gut is dead, right? Our gut is dying, at least. And so these are the orchestrators in the environment that became the orchestrators in our gut. And it's uh, through years and years of co-evolution, they figured out what part of the gut to sporulate in, which part to desporulate in, which part to interact with, what part of our uh, immune system, and then, of course, they, they orchestrate the rest of the population of the microbiome. This is nuts. I have never heard about this or never thought about it like this, but you're exactly right. Yeah. Whoever the creator is, yeah. 
said, well, I'm going to send these meteors, and I'm, I've got these guys that are going to survive all the way there, let them help you out, and all we're doing is just spraying shit, yep. getting rid of them. Totally. Everywhere. Yeah. And that's why I say, we're a microbial construct put in an antimicrobial world. So no doubt we have a significant amount of chronic disease, right? It's, it's, no, it's not unthinkable when you go, well, 30, 40 years ago, we only had, what, 25, 30 autoimmune diseases, and now we have over 110. So we've created diseases for ourselves to deal with over the last 25, 30 years, and so much of that can really be rationally tracked back to the idea that we continue to use more and more antimicrobial systems, whether it's on our crops, in our water, in our homes, in our food, and so on. In your studies, have you seen that when somebody is on Megaspore, that you've now determined that they come in, they can survive the upper uh, small bowel, they go into that vegetative state, they go back to spore, then they yeah. go into vegetative state, then they come out and then they're spore again to yeah. repopulate the soil or whatever it is that's there. Have you seen an increase in the proliferation as it comes through? In other words, yeah. can, they, um, can they duplicate while they're in this environment? Can we produce more of these? In our gut itself? In our gut. They do, yeah. Yeah, they do. Now, what's interesting about that is we did some systems where we were trying to overload the gut with spores to figure out can it get to, because we have people that ask us, well, if you take the same five strains every day, don't you create some sort of monoculture or something like that? And we said, well, we, we don't think you would because this is almost natural levels of exposure that you're supposed to get from the soil. And so we wouldn't have this diverse microbiome if, if, if that actually would happen. And so we did testing where we were trying to overload a, a microbiome with the spores, and we found that they reach a certain threshold level of themselves within the gut, and they don't allow themselves to exceed that. They keep that. each other in check. They keep it in check. These are smart, smart little critters. Totally. Yeah. Holy cow. Far smarter than we are because yeah. they know more about our gut than we do, right? We can't look in our gut and go, our gut is off because we don't know what a healthy microbiome is supposed to look like. But they can go in there and go, yeah, this is not right, and tinker around with things and fix things. You know, and because of that, we, the first published study we did was on leaky gut. Right? We, we've had this, this idea that leaky gut is really a result of dysbiosis, a dysfunction mm -hmm. in the bacterial population. And so with our thinking that the spores can go in there and fix the dysfunction, it should be able to resolve leaky gut. And sure enough, we have, I think, the only published study on a probiotic that shows it can resolve leaky gut in as little as 30 days. Wow. Uh, totally sealed up the tight junctions, uh, no more uh, toxins leaking through into the circulation, and then all of the inflammatory cytokines that we looked at all came down significantly in that 30 days. So period. I kind of want to highlight that because yeah. there's well over 3,300 studies specifically to talk about permeability in the gut. Yeah. And the thing that really drew Ken and I to what you were doing with Megaspore yeah. is that research right there. Yeah. Because nobody else with a probiotic, regardless of delivery system, does anything like what Megaspore does, yeah. and nobody's been able to demonstrate that. The same yeah. thing. Yeah, absolutely. And and we were super excited about it because when we when we proved that then with leaky gut, and we know that leaky gut drives so many other chronic illnesses, we said, okay, if we can resolve leaky gut with the probiotic, then we should be able to fix other things that, that are a result of leaky gut. So since then, we've done a triglyceride study, elevated triglyceride. Uh, we, this study is going through peer review right now. Hopefully it'll be published in the next couple of months. But we saw about a 40 to 45% reduction in elevated triglycerides in a 90 day period. Compare that to like a prescription like a statin. Brings down triglycerides maybe 15% at best, you know? And then of course all these side effects. Even the prescription fish oil, which is a good thing to take, but the prescription fish oil brings down triglycerides by 25% at best. This is over 40%. Uh, we saw we just completed a study on acne because we know if you have leaky gut you're going to have inflamed skin. We saw a 40% reduction in acne lesion counts in 30 days, and compare that to the prescription uh, antibiotic that's used, Accutane. It takes them 90 days to achieve that with all of the side effects that you get from taking the antibiotic. You know? So yeah, so we have seen all kinds of stuff also when we treat people with Atrantil. Um, it's shocking how many people come up and say, "Oh, my rosacea cleared up." Like yeah. these other non-gut issues get better totally. and it makes sense because it's just inflammatory cytokines floating around yeah and the gut is the biggest source of chronic low-grade inflammation and we know chronic low-grade inflammation is the biggest driver of chronic disease um you know the american diabetic association is doing a whole bunch of studies on endotoxemia which is a kind of leaky gut that we study and they have 
at least 15 published studies showing that endotoxemia is the primary cause of, of the onset of diabetes. In fact, there's a study that just published earlier this year called a Cordioprev study. And it was 462 patients. And these are all patients that have high risk factors for developing type 2 diabetes. So they're obese, they have history of heart disease, all that stuff. And they followed these patients over 60 months. And they measured all different types of cytokines and inflammatory markers and all that to try to figure out which one of those things were the best predictors of the development of type 2 diabetes. What they showed was leaky gut and the leaking in of an endotoxin called LPS was the only marker that could predict diabetes. Hmm. Triglycerides, and inflammatory uh, markers, uh, you know, interleukin-6, all of that stuff, CRP, none of that stuff correlated 100%. The only thing was the leakiness in the gut and the migration of that endotoxin. And so they even recommended that physicians use that endotoxin as a, as a predictor of diabetes risk. So everything else didn't matter as much as that endotoxin. So we talked about a study that was done at TCU on, mm -hmm. uh, a couple shows ago where they actually looked at people and they induced yeah. basically inflammation by injecting LPS yeah. and then monitoring them. And what they found is that the people in the study, the, it was to their surprise, when you talked about the bacteria and social and all this, yeah. they showed lack of impulse control, emotional yes. lability, mm -hmm. and they were very surprised about that. And then they actually said that there was a tendency towards addiction mm -hmm. because the inflammatory process actually caused some neuroinflammation. Yeah, yeah, and in fact, there's evidence that shows that LPS from the gut leaks through, can end up in the brain and actually interfere with dopamine binding in dopamine receptors. Oh, that's fascinating. I've and, not seen that. Yeah. And so you, even though your body's releasing dopamine, you're not binding dopamine. So then you're looking for a dopamine fix and you get into addictive behavior because most addictive behaviors are driven by a dopamine fix, you know, a need for a dopamine fix. That's exactly it. Yeah. yeah. So, so you're interfering with your dopamine binding from this leakiness in your gut. You know, something I wanted to bring up, one of the happiest animals I've ever met that probably has really high dopamine is a camel. <laughs> yes, you know, yeah, we, absolutely. We, we need to get to the camel I want to hear about story. the camel dung story. <laughs> the camel dung story is fascinating. So in during World War II, the German army had, part of their campaign was in North Africa. Um, and this is super well documented. It was documented by a pharmaceutical company uh, started in Germany. And what they saw was that most of the, the German soldiers were dying of dysentery. And what they noticed was the locals, when they would get gut infections of dysentery, that what they would do to stop it was they would find dried camel dung and they would consume the camel dung. And eating the camel dung would stop the dysentery. So they took a bunch of the camel dung back to Germany and they tried to figure out what was in the camel dung that actually stopped the, the gut infection. And they found Bacillus subtilis spores, which is the same spore that we work with. And so they launched that as a prescription drug in 1952 to treat dysentery from the camel dung use in North Africa. You know, and that was the first time that the spores were used in the medical world. Um, and, but they've been using it in, in North Africa and other parts of the savanna for literally thousands of years to treat gut infections. You know, and, the, and, so, and it's also fascinating that NIH recently published a study last year you know, we know that we're, we're reaching this post-antibiotic world, right? MRSA is a big issue. Yeah. So methicillin-resistant staph. Um, they did a big, I think it was a 500-patient study in Thailand, Southeast Asia. They sampled a whole bunch of people, and they were looking for the prevalence rate of MRSA colonization in people in different body sites, on the skin, in the oral cavity, and so on. What they found was that there was a really high prevalence rate of colonization by methicillin-resistant staph, which is a very scary bacteria. If it starts to infect, it becomes a major problem. Um, it was like somewhere around 35 or 40 percent of people had colonization by MRSA. But here's the thing that was interesting. When they looked at the people that did not have any MRSA colonization, they were trying to look at their entire microbiome, the entire ecology, uh, ecological uh, setup of their body, the only difference they could find between people that had MRSA colonization and did not have it was that the people that did not have it had high levels of Bacillus subtilis spores in their system. And so they could actually see they could actually see the spores. They could see the spores. They could culture the spores, so they could see that the spores were protecting these people against MRSA colonization. That's how much they afford us the protection, and and, and they've been here for millions of years. We just have to be smart enough to put it back in our system. This is going to be really cool because we're launching the subscription box here, the DHAT subscription box, yeah. and we're teaming up. Absolutely. And we're Altron honored Teo to do that plus with you Megaspore. Guys. 
we got a, we got one minute left because this is really one of the best deep dive scientific discussions we've had so far on gut yeah. checks. So, real quick, Ken, uh, Karan, talk a little bit about the partnership between Atron Teal, Megaspore, and why. I mean, honestly, why we're excited to be able to do. So this. I'll tell you how how I actually heard about you yep. first. It's because I had all these functional medicine doctors go. You need to meet this brilliant guy who I think has something that can actually augment your product. Totally, yeah. And that's when you and Eric got in touch, and I'm so glad that we did. And very clearly, you know your shit. So I'm <laughs> glad that we met. I'm a bacteria nerd. <laughs> I, I, I even know camel shit. Actually, yeah, you do. As it turns out, no, absolutely. It's a it's a great partnership because what you guys have developed with Entrep Tail and the um, what that does in the body is so complementary to what the spores do. In fact, I bet that both products would enhance each other's effect. It would be quite complementary. Yeah. You know, and when, when we've seen that with other things like prebiotics or polyphenols, we see an enhanced impact. So I think the two products in combination will be a true symbiotic, which is where one, one product would dramatically enhance the effect of the other. So I'm totally uh, excited for this partnership because um, I think if we're e- if both of us are independently fixing guts now, yeah, when we combine it, we're going to be really fixing some guts across the board. So this is fascinating. This is our first road show. Karan, you'll always be the first person yes, we ever did on it. the road show. Yes, Gut Check Project, uh, man. So we're down here in San Antonio at the IFM. What is it called? The AIC? I can't even remember. Annual International Conference. Oh yes, is that uh-huh. what it stands for? Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. So we're down here talking to a lot of functional, med- uh, functional medicine practitioners, MDs, DOs, nurse practitioners, et cetera. It's an incredible conference. Yep. Can't thank you enough for taking the time to so carve out and hang out with Ken and pleasure. I. Yeah. Ken, any parting words? I just love to nerd out once in a while. That is yeah. awesome. You are thank the man. Thank you so much. Thank you. My so pleasure. If you missed anything, you need to go back to how Camel Joe was the first fecal <laughs> transplant donor. All right. <laughs> see you all next time. 